Well, good afternoon, or still good morning, I guess. Thank you, John, uh, for your introduction. And thank you to Times Higher Education for bringing together so many exceptional leaders from around the world. As president of the Association of American Universities, I am privileged to represent 62 of the finest public and private research universities in the United States and Canada. That includes our host this week, the University of California, Berkeley, as well as two institutions where I served as president, the universities of Michigan and Iowa. I believe deeply in the power of AAU universities to make a difference as evidenced by their presence in any and all serious rankings of the world's leading universities, from Harvard and Johns Hopkins to Texas and Washington these research universities foster innovation, attract and advance talent, and improve the quality of our lives. I'm here today, though, not only as AAU president, I'm here as a former university president and as a scientist, and I'm here as a grandparent and citizen who wants a prosperous, educated world for future generations. And we're all here because of our belief in and concern for higher education and its essential role in society. I've mentioned Iowa and Michigan, as well as Berkeley and Washington, and I really can't deny a special affection for this country's public universities. Public universities carried me here today, and it's where I've devoted my entire career. I'm indebted also to the universities of Texas, Kentucky, North Carolina, and New Mexico, in addition to Iowa and Michigan, for exceptional teaching, research, and leadership opportunities. And I'm really pleased that the World Academic Summit is being held for the first time in the United States. American higher education, and particularly public higher education, is one of the monumental achievements of our country. President Thomas Jefferson rightfully, was rightfully adamant that a cornerstone of democracy is education for all from the richest to the poorest. But let's not be parochial here. Accessible quality higher education matters everywhere. That's obvious by the voices being heard at this summit from Germany and India to Brazil and New Zealand. Higher education is both a public good and a global concern. And yet in this country and around the world, Higher education is a public good lacking public support. I want, want to explore that a bit today by looking backward as well as trying to predict the future. Because there are signs, small, noteworthy signs, that society is prepared to step forward and protect our colleges and universities before they are irreversibly damaged. I want to believe that we are nearing a tipping point that will, after years of neglect, restore a public higher education to its rightful place. The current landscape is a ravaged one for America's public universities and colleges. In a 15-year span, starting in the year 2000, investment by American state governments in public higher education declined 30 percent. That's 30 percent. It was an ominous start to the 21st century and a large step backward in a nation aiming to have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world by the year 2020. If we look at the funding scenario that began in 2008 with the Great Recession, the data across our country are numbing. Public funding for higher education in Arizona is down 56%. Wisconsin is down 25%. Pennsylvania, 33%. Illinois, 54%. If our stock markets trended like this, our nation would be in a dead panic. And yet, sadly, we aren't. My friend Jonathan Cole, who served ably as provost at Columbia University and who has written extensively about American higher education and the American university, does not mince words in assessing the landscape. This is a quote. This amounts to pillaging of the country's great state universities. 
As government funding drops, the cost of education rises for students and families. At the same time, universities are forced to cut programs and services. They strive to remain affordable while potentially weakening their quality. These forces have left public universities increasingly compromised in our mission to move America forward. It is an unsustainable world for all involved. Just as damaging, though, is the decline in financial support is the moral disinvestment. Their skepticism about the value of a college degree and the purpose of a liberal arts education that is both troubling and disheartening. It is a skepticism that does not speak to our values as a democratic society that was first in the world to offer free public K through 12 education. We must reiterate that public universities matter. Higher education is a public good. We all embrace this and we promote it, but it cannot be said enough. Higher education is a public good. In this country, more than 85% of students who graduated from high school enroll in some form of college within eight years. 85% is a staggering number and one we should take pride in. And when these students select a college or university, 80% of them enroll in a public institution. There are currently more than 17 million undergraduate students in American higher education today, and eight of every 10 are matriculating at a public university. In addition to public community colleges and regional universities, every state in this country has at least one public university recognized for its high or very high research activity. These are research universities like Wisconsin, Florida, Ohio State, and Texas. Most states have two, three or more of these high activity research institutions. The opposite holds true for private universities. Visit more than half of our states and you will not encounter a single private university, a private research university. So public universities are the workhorses of American teaching and research. And the benefits to society are powerful. We know that university graduates will see greater financial success in their lifetime than a typical high school graduate to the point that their earnings difference will far outpace the original cost. And that's a pretty impressive return on investment. And there are other benefits. People with a college or university degree are more likely to exercise, less likely to smoke, more likely to vote, and are the first to volunteer and give back to their communities. Let me share one more payback from investing in higher education. When the federal government awards research dollars to universities, those funds support faculty, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, clinicians, and others. We all know this, but the impact goes much, much further than most people realize. Research requires equipment, technology, goods, and services, which means a research grant awarded to Georgia Tech or the University of Oregon will benefit vendors across town or across the country. Researchers at the University of Michigan working at IRIS, or the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science, are using big data to validate the economic and social effects of university research. IRIS studied the spread of federal research spending at only 15 universities in only 12 states. They tracked more than 2.2 billion in research dollars spent in these 12 states and demonstrated how the money spread to vendors and contractors in more than 1,600 counties across the nation. That's 1,600 counties. In short, one of every two counties in America is reaping the benefits of university research and that is only for 15 universities. Think if you took the whole universe of universities and did the same analysis. When plotting the spread of these dollars on a map, 
it appears that measles have broken out across our nation. It's an epidemic, and it's a very healthy one at that. University research not only delivers cures and answers, it also provides livelihoods for hundreds of thousands of people. All of these data, from personal income of graduates to nationwide vendor support and impact, are important to measure and quantify. It validates our work. And yet, we know that higher education is not a commodity. We're not the newest smartphone, smartphone or hybrid car to hit the market, although we probably developed the technology behind it. We exist for our mission to serve the public. Public universities have a compact with society and especially the citizens of our states to work on their behalf and promote the greater good. At the turn of the 19th century, Thomas Jefferson sat in his home in Virginia with a judge from the Michigan Territory named Augustus Woodward. They exchanged stories and ideas united in their passion about the necessity of public education in the new republic. They believed that human knowledge could and should be cataloged and classified. And most significantly, though, they understood that democracy demanded an educated citizenry. Augustus Woodward would become one of the founders of the University of Michigan, a place that I know very well. Thomas Jefferson would, of course, establish the University of Virginia. Next year, the University of Michigan will celebrate its bicentennial, followed in 2018 by Virginia. Few American institutions have endured for 200 years, and even fewer have global reputation and impact. Thomas Jefferson said at the time that he wanted his university to be, quote, worth patronizing with the public support and be a temptation to the youths of other states to come and drink the cup of knowledge. So listen again to his words, worth patronizing with the public support. His philosophy that a university serves the people who in turn support the institution spread as our nation grew. It was embodied here at UC Berkeley when the very first building was erected in 1872. A regent then espoused the democratic roots of the university, declaring that, quote, the state is bound to furnish the citizen the means of discharging the duties it imposes upon him. If the state imposes duties that require intelligence, it is the office of the state to furnish the means of intelligence. That is what is at risk. The means to educate the broadest possible swath of our society for the betterment of our society with full public support. Inclusiveness is in the DNA of higher education. I am deeply concerned about the plight of public universities because of our ability and our obligation to educate students from all walks of life, particularly low income, first generation and underrepresented students. We cannot lose sight of that, particularly as our society grows more diverse. And we should not forget that American universities are a beacon for international students. Since the year 2000, the number of international students at American universities has grown by 67%. They enrich our classrooms and laboratories as much as our universities transform them. I truly didn't come here today to spout doom and gloom about higher education's place in the world. Like you, I may at times feel discouraged, but not defeated. I live and breathe higher education, and I'm not going to walk away from something so vital. We are, I believe, at a tipping point. The question is which way public higher education will fall and who will do the pushing. Barring a major change in attitudes and actions, I fear public higher education will be that in name only, no longer a public good but a private one. But I'm also an optimist by nature and fervently believe we will not abandon such an essential feature of American democracy. There is no turning back from extinction. I'm reminded of the Endangered Species Act of 1973 and how we in the United States came to realize the permanent damage being done to animal life. 
Majestic creatures such as the bald eagle, grizzly bear, and whooping crane were deeply, deeply threatened by urban sprawl, pollution, and hunting. Legislation saved them and hundreds of other creatures. To quote the framers of the act, our ability to destroy or almost destroy all intelligent life on the planet became apparent only in this generation. A certain humility and a sense of urgency seem indicated. Humility and urgency. I am cautiously optimistic, quite cautiously. We're seeing both in the support of public universities. In the last year, legislators in 38 American states have increased per student funding. These are baby steps. The increase amounts to less than 3%, but baby steps in the right direction. At the same time, only four states have returned to funding levels above those of 2008 when the recession stuck, struck. In other words, 46 U.S. states continue to spend less on students than before the financial downturn. Still, I'm hopeful. Hopeful because higher education is, is the focus of a new documentary film called Starving the Beast. It examines 35 years of cuts to public universities and the growing view that a college or university education is merely a private commodity to be purchased. It's been a decade now since the release of another documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, and its examination of climate change. Studies have shown that film both raised awareness about global warming and inspired people to act. And it has staying power. As the film marked its 10-year anniversary this summer, people were asked how it affected them. The responses were quite telling. Quote, we've made some strides, but there's still a lot to do. 10 years later, and more important than ever, one of the main reasons I did an environmental science degree. Collectively, we need to act. Will starving the beast have a similar impact? I'm not sure. But that it was produced in the first place and is in theaters and drawing media attention tells me that our concerns as educators are beginning to take hold at a wider level. And I strongly support the sentiment that collectively we need to act. For the past three years, I've served as co-chair of the Lincoln Project, an initiative of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. My fellow co-chair is Robert Bergenot, who devoted nine years here as Berkeley's chancellor. The Lincoln Project honors Abraham Lincoln's historic signing of the Morrill Act in 1862, which led to the nation's extraordinary system of public universities. We traveled the country, talking to university presidents, business executives, foundation leaders, and state legislators about the future of our public research universities. Recognizing the complexity of the problems we face augurs our capacity to solve them as a nation and as global citizens. This is what led the Lincoln Project to issue a clarion call for a 21st century compact to revive, stabilize, and ultimately strengthen public research universities. We invoke the spirit of both Lincoln and Jefferson in restoring the bond between society and its universities. We recommend three overarching strategies. Collectively, we must correct financial imbalances. American states must develop alternative strategies besides cutting university funding to balance state budgets. At the same time, universities must become more efficient and seek out new revenue streams. Second, we must create public-private partnerships to sustain and strengthen research and education in the future. The private sector should acknowledge the importance of public research universities to the workforce by supporting scholarships and internships. And third, we must improve student access and performance by simplifying financial aid, tracking student performance, and making it easier for students to transfer. Our universities have made such strong gains in enrolling students, but we must do more to help them complete their degrees. 
only about 60% are earning their bachelor's degree, and they need close to six years to do so. We can and must do better, all of us. The first chancellor of this great university was Clark Kerr, who then rose to the UC president. He was the architect of a state system that came to be admired worldwide. He did so much to define public higher education in the latter half of the 20th century and believed in education for all. As society goes, he said, so goes the university. But also, as the university goes, so goes society. The progress of knowledge remains so central to the progress of civilization. Our collective progress and prosperity hinge on quality higher education. It is the strongest argument for lifting up our public universities. The onus is on all of us, faculty, elected officials, university presidents, business leaders, philanthropists, and parents, to push for effective answers, to tip higher education in the right direction for the good of tomorrow. I trust that together we will see America's public universities are powerful, productive, and globally relevant for the 21st century. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Mary Sue. Let's go straight to questions from the audience. There's an alarm at the back. If you could just tell us who you are and what your affiliation is. Uh, yes, uh, hello, I'm Mitchell Stevens. I'm a sociologist at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. I'm colleagues with uh, Tim McKay and Jason Owen Smith oh, yeah, and Elizabeth yeah. Armstrong and, yeah. and, and just so impressed by the model that Michigan has offered the rest of the country. Um, Stanford has a new president. And I'm wondering um, what advice or encouragement you might give to him <laughs> and his colleagues yeah. at the exceptionally well-resourced private universities that Michigan calls peers. Sure. Uh, your new president, Mark, is a fabulous, fabulous uh, scientist and uh, has just moved from Rockefeller University to Stanford. And so, uh, you know, he, he's the kind of inspirational leader that I think, uh, you know, will be enormously successful. You know, one of the questions that comes up, and you know, I'd sort of like your your sort of uh, suggest your your idea about it or your reaction to it, is that Stanford does have unbelievable resources. I mean, it has been so successful, probably one of the most successful universities in the world at raising private philanthropy, and this has been to the great benefit of the students. But would Stanford ever consider doubling its enrollment? Would it ever consider making this exceptional, exceptional opportunity available to more students? Would it ever consider doubling the number of Pell Grant students? I mean, th those I think are the important questions that the, the institution has to decide. Um, Stanford's a great research university. It's going to, to continue to do wonderful things, and it's this mix between the research and the undergraduate education and graduate education that I think provides the magic. Um, but I do think that there's some things, some big things that Stanford could do that, you know, it would be symbolic. And perhaps many well-resourced uh, private universities should, should think about expanding their enrollments, educating more students, and particularly students that we know need help. That, that's what I would say. Did you have another question? Uh, well, just because you think you're invited to respond. Yeah. There are, there's, growing, uh, there's growing discussion here in the region about ways in which, in which the different kinds of universities that serve Northern California might cooperate to enhance capacity. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to me that I can expect Stanford to double in size or cut its tuition in half. But might there be ways in which the leaders of very different kinds mm -hmm. of institutions oh, should sure. cooperate in distributing capacity in new ways. Sure, sure, of course, and I, you know, and that has to come from discussions with the faculty. But we all we already know, you know, California is such a great model state because it has this tremendous community college system. It already has this well uh, pathway, this this really good pathway where students can start and finish. Maybe students could start at, at community college, finish at Stanford. I, I mean. I, how can Stanford participate? I think that's something that the faculty need to decide. But I think there are lots of options out there that we need to look at. And this is, this is the state to do it in, because you have all the good 
articulation agreements, you've got all of the, the institutions that, you know, do that service across the spectrum. Can I ask a, a follow-up question to that? We, we've, um, we all know that public universities have these missions to uh, affordability, accessibility, yeah. community. Um, but you mentioned statistics in your, in your speech, and there are many others, not least, you know, if you look at someone like Harvard, the cost of attending Harvard after financial aid may now actually be less than some of the, the, mm -hmm. the publics. And uh, uh, we know that the rise of tuition fees, some large publics now have less than 10% of, of public funding. So. I suppose my question is, is there a convergence of public and private that actually is to the detriment of public universities as a distinct part of the ecosystem? Is there a risk that actually what makes public unique is, is sort of dissipating somewhere? I think there is that risk. And uh, because of the financial pressures, what many public universities have done in, in order to save themselves, I mean, this is not because they wanted to change the compact that they have with their states, but they're accepting more international students, they're accepting more out-of-state students, because these students, they can charge, you know, what it actually costs to educate them, rather than the very much discounted rate. Um, so yes, I think there is a convergence. I don't think it's a complete convergence, and I think they're still the sort of distinctly different sort of ecosystem within the public universities. It's something that we want, we really do want to keep it. Uh, I think it would be a tragedy for the nation if we gave it up. But there are lots of interesting uh, things happening. I mean, I, I am not a proponent of free tuition for public universities. I don't, first of all, I don't think it's feasible, and I don't even think it's right. I mean, why should we subsidize the education of people who can afford to pay? I much prefer the model that Michigan has pursued for a long time. It's a high tuition, high aid model. So that because of our particular demographic, we can guarantee every in-state student at Michigan affordability. I mean, so it doesn't matter what the, what the rate is. If you have a uh, family income lower than a certain level, it's about 40 or 30,000, I can't remember exactly, it's free. So it's not only paid tuition, it pays your room and board. You don't have to pay at all. I mean, for me, that, that is the ultimate public good. It's a wealth transfer scheme mm. because we're charging the families who can afford to pay to help the students who can't afford to pay. Yeah. Any more questions from the floor? I'm squinting into the lights, I can't see you particularly well. Pick your hand up if you've got any more. I'll just ask one, one more question. In terms of the lo legitimacy of uh, public universities and the sort of social buy-in and the political clout that they have, it was mentioned in an earlier session with Bernd Huber and, and Nick Dirks that in Germany there's this real political legitimacy because anyone who can attend, anyone who wants to mm -hmm. attend uh, mm -hmm. a university like LMU can. Um, and of course, we're in a position now where public universities are becoming increasingly selective in their mm -hmm. approach. Do you worry there that that's, there's a sort of, if you like, a, a vicious circle going on where universities become more selective, therefore they yeah. lose public legitimacy, therefore that feeds through to the funding cuts, and that there's a sort of spiral here that, that we're just going to struggle sure. to get out of? Sure, and I thought that was a very interesting insight that Nick Dirks gave, is that one of the things that we are experiencing is uh, sort of we're victims of our own success because w we accept, you know, just a proportion, a small proportion of the number of students who apply, and we're not open admission. The thing that I think counters that argument about the public support is that even the open admission universities in, in, in Michigan and all, all around the country are not getting public support either. So it isn't, and it, it becomes sort of an excuse, but I think it's something that we can, we can counter in the, in the public discourse. Uh, and we should be countering it in the public discourse. So I don't quite buy into this notion that that's the whole problem. I do think another big problem is that people don't understand the difference between the sticker price and the net price. So that they don't take into a, to account financial aid and when a poor family looks and says, oh, it's $60,000, they don't understand mm. that if their child can get into Harvard or Princeton or Stanford, they're going to pay virtually nothing. But, but that's, the, that's the thing that we, it's complicated, we have to be able to describe it in more simple mm. terms. Okay, and just finally, well, you, you talked about, you, you injected a bit of optimism into your speech towards the end, but you did talk quite bleakly about irreparable, irreparable damage, damage and a tipping point. How close are we, do you think, to that, that point at which actually... Well, know? I guess we always think that we're on the brink of catastrophe. Um, 
you know, but I've seen what's happened across the country. I, you know, I think American higher education has been enormously resilient through the, to the, through the Great Recession, and I give all sorts of credit to the leaders of these institutions, regional institutions all across, for, for accommodating. But you can only go so far, and, and we do know that class sizes are getting bigger. We do know that student services are being cut. We, uh, we see this. There are more non-tenure track faculty than tenure track faculty now because people have had to accommodate and use other mechanisms to cover costs. So it is a danger. I think we're in the danger zone. The danger zone. It's fascinating uh, insights, and uh, I think it's probably time for lunch. So uh, okay. thank you very much, Mary Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.